this folkloric text is from the Federal Narcotics Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. Well, a, more a prison than a hospital, actually. People actually did sentences there. There is an exclusive wing of Lexington reserved for the due rights, who are considered good rehabilitation prospects that get better rooms and more medication. A due right always shows up with letters from his employer and congressman, pictures of himself as an Eagle Scout shaking hands with a priest. Uh, the doctor walks into the ward. You know, really warm in here. As one man, the do rights break out in a sweat and rush around opening windows. A bit cold in here, isn't it? Immediately, the do rights see their breath in the air, snatch blankets, and bundle themselves up to a chorus of chattering teeth. Front office, brown nose, fink to the bone. Doctor, when I die, I want to be buried right in the same coffin with you. <laughs> you are the finest, the most decent, the most deeply humane man I've ever known. I'm putting you down for additional medication, son. Thank you, Dr. Pusher, who should receive the death penalty. It's the old army game from here to eternity. Get there first just with the brownest nose. While down the dim gray wards and day rooms where the do wrongs hawk and spit and shiver and vomit, Buck and Croker wouldn't give me a goat bowl. Ask me what the American flag means to me, and I tell him, suck it in heroin, Doc, and I'll suck it. He says I got the wrong attitude. I should see the chaplain get straight with Jesus. And then, with the tears streaming down their lousy pink faces, the do rights leap up as one man and bellow out the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you, William. Uh, what made you become a writer? Um, I'm referring to rem your remar remark in the preface to Queer, where you said that your wife, uh, wife Joan's death, uh, had uh, played an important part in your decision to say, I have to go into writing now. What... Um, yes, but it's, excuse me, it's never, a, I don't think it's a conscious decision um, at all until you're, until you've really committed yourself. Uh, Seven asked Genet when he started to write, and he said, at birth. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that there's something uh, particular in the chromosomes of a writer, but it does mean that all his experience um, is focused in that direction long before he puts pen to paper or uh, sits down with a typewriter. Mm -hmm. And you'll remember that something that happened years ago, and that will fit right into what I'm writing now. So my past experience then becomes meaningful uh, in terms of material for writing in the future. Mm -hmm. But I was uh, comparatively yeah. late. You see, I wrote Junkie at the age of 35. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was published in, um, in 1963. Publication is, I think, very important to a writer. If I hadn't succeeded in publishing Junkie, I might just have given up uh, writing. What do you think the, st the, the, the fact or the state of death represents? Is it just a, an end of something, or is it a transition, or...? Like when we mentioned uh, books like the, the Tibetan uh, Book of the Dead, Dead and all that, uh, do they indicate that there is more than we normally realize in our we, culture? We, please don't do yeah. we. It depends. There are all that kinds. Of, there are all kinds of, of attitudes. No, I mean in uh, our culture towards death. 
Well, as I said, uh, Kim had never doubted the existence of gods or the possibility of an afterlife. Mm -hmm. And Kim is my alter ego and spokesman, like Larry speaks. He's, he's as the White House spokesman. Yeah. Um, but now, however, the Egyptian and the Tibetan Book of the Dead are quite different because the uh, Tibetan book was um, based on the premises of reincarnation, mm -hmm. whereas the, the Egyptians had no uh, concept of reincarnation. But they believed in death after or, or, or resurrection because they you know, kept their mummies. Ah, uh, yes, but only those people who had mummies could resurrect themselves. They needed a body. They needed a body. That's why the Egyptians took to Christianity like a vulture takes to carrion. It's the resurrection of the body. Mm -hmm. This whole mummy concept, which I find, uh, well, very, um, very unsatisfactory, put it mildly. Well, and your personal feeling about that? Is, do you believe in re reincarnation? Oh, yes, I, I more or less take that, uh, that for granted possibility of reincarnation and of course I agree with the uh, with the Buddhist uh, system that it is something to be avoided if possible mm -hmm. it's the worst thing that can happen el mega delito del hombre es haber nacido what's that in English? that means the worst delito mistake uh, you could say, is to have been born in the first place. Again, that's my alter ego, has never doubted the existence of gods or the possibility of an afterlife. He feels that immortality is the only goal worth striving for. He knows it is not something you just automatically get for believing something like Christianity or Islam. It is something you have to work and fight for, like everything else in this life or another. And the most precarious, arbitrary, and bureaucratic immortality blueprint was drafted by the ancient Egyptians. First, you had to get yourself mummified, and that was very expensive, making immortality a monopoly of the truly rich. And then you had to reserve a tomb in an accredited necropolis, and all the new rich were trying to buy into a good necropolis, like a good country club. Uh, so you got your mummy in a decent, reputable tomb. However, your continued existence in the Western lands was entirely contingent on the continued existence and welfare of your mummy. That is why they had their mummies hid good and protected by potent curses. Well, the mummy is your basic passport. You must also know the names. You shall not pass unless you know my name for pages after page in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Well, here is plain citizen horse. He's got enough vigor and vitality to survive his physical death. Well, he won't get far. He's got no mummy. He's got no names. He's got nothing. What happens to a bum like that? A nameless, mummyless asshole? <laughs> well, demons will swarm all over him at the first checkpoint. He will be dismembered and thrown into a flaming pit where his soul will be utterly consumed and destroyed forever. While others would sell mummies the right names to drop in the right places, sail through the western lands. Of course, there are some second-class souls who just barely squeeze through their mummies is not in a sound sanitary condition. These creeps are relegated to third-rate transient hotels just beyond the last checkpoint 
where they can smell the charnel house disposal oven from their skimpy balcony. You see that sign, the bartender smells? Maggoty mummies will not be served here. <laughs> Might as well pay specs, my mummy's going downhill. Cheap job to begin with. Good, maggots just crawling all over it. The way that demon guards lifted me this morning. Transient hotels. Well, here you are in your luxury condo deep in the western lands. You got no security. Some disgruntled former employee sneaks in your tomb and throws ass in your mommy's face. Or sloshes gasoline all and burns the shit out of it. Ooh, somebody's fucking with my mummy. And brother, you are fucked. See, mummies are sitting ducks. No matter who you are, what can happen to your mummy's a pharaoh's nightmare. Grave robbers, scavengers, the dreaded mummy bashers. Explosions, my God, the worst thing can happen to a mummy. No nukes is good nukes to a mummy. Well, you know, this planet could be a reasonably pleasant place to live if everybody could just mind his own business and let others do the same. But a wise old black faggot said to me years ago, some people are shits, darling. <laughs> oh, I, I was never able to forget it. All right, let's get back to the subject of the writer. What is the, 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 uh, the original feel of the writer? What uh, mechanisms should he consider, work on? Uh, the word should should never arise. Yeah. There is no such concept as should with regard to art or anything unless you specify. In other words, if you're trying to build a bridge, then you can say we should do this and we should do that with respect to getting a bridge built. But it doesn't float in a vacuum. I, my uh, feeling about art is that one very important aspect of art is that it makes people aware of what they know and don't know that they know. Now, this applies not only to all, or all uh, creative thinking. For example, people on the seacoast in the Middle Ages, they knew the earth was round. They believed the earth was flat because the church said so. Galileo says, <coughs> tells him the earth is round and nearly was burned at the stake for saying so. <coughs> Cezanne uh, shows people uh, what objects look at seen from a certain angle and in a certain light. And literally, people just thought he'd thrown paint on canvas and uh, they attacked his, um, his canvases with umbrellas when they were first exhibited. Well, now no child would have any difficulty in seeing a Cezanne. That is, once the breakthrough is made, uh, there is a permanent expansion of awareness, but uh, there's always uh, um, a reaction of rage, of outrage, at the first breakthrough. Mm. And, uh, for example, Joyce then made people aware of their, their stream of consciousness, at least on one level, on a verbal level. And he was at first accused of being unintelligible. I don't think many people now would have any difficulty with Ulysses. <clears throat> no. So the artist then uh, expands awareness. And once the, uh, once the breakthrough is made, this becomes part of the, of the general awareness. So it's a matter of seeing things in a new way, differently. Well, <clears throat> yes, but seeing things that are there. And, uh, well, I'm interested in the, the of, of seeing that takes me to the subject of a picture. Mm. Like, the, uh, we have an alphabetical writing Like, uh, but uh, the Chinese, for example, they have a ideogrammic way of writing, and for they, some people say they have a different way of thinking because of that. Does the the, the visual 
aspect? Is that important, or does it, be, does it become more important? Well, I think it's, uh, it's quite important to have uh, um, so-called pictorial writing like uh, <clears throat> Egyptian hieroglyphs. Well, it is not as completely pictorial as people might think. Uh, the grammar is extremely complicated, and you must have a number of concepts that are, um, that are arbitrary. Mm. That is, the word for dawn will be uh, sun, but there are also what is known as determinatives yes. uh, that must accompany that. So um, <clears throat> there are many arbitrary uh, factors in it's any uh, pictorial system. A set of symbols that could be arranged in different ways. Yes, but uh, for example, how do you say uh, your propositions uh, in pictures? The answer is you don't. You you have pictures that represent them, but they're arbitrary. Maybe you could say uh, we could say that should could not be expressed in pictures. I don't think it could. Yeah. Sometimes I will ask someone. You know, they are asking me uh, something. I said, "Well, draw me a picture of it." <clears throat> If they can't do that, I said, well, then, where is it? What does it mean? I think that's an important... Uh, Very. Uh, of the yeah. visualizing yes. things. Particularly and, for a writer and artist. Mm. Uh, well, that takes us right into the subject of uh, language, uh, the way it is used in our culture, in the Western alphabetical culture. Um, and techniques that are uh, that uh, have been found, like cut-ups, to counter the effect of uh, a language becoming more and more abstract and meaningless. Well, yes, you see, the um, I'd spoken about the artist people uh, making people aware of what they know and don't know that they know. Uh, that is the cons the the cut-up is really much closer to the actual facts of perception. As soon as you look out the window, look around the room, walk down the street, your consciousness is being cut by random factors. Life is a cut-up. Now, the cut-ups are really closer to the uh, actual fact of perceptions, mm -hmm. of human perception, than, um, should we say, narrative, a straight narrative, linear narrative. See, the cut-ups was, uh, was not my idea, it was Brian Geisen's idea. It's essentially a painter's idea of applying the, uh, the techniques of painting to writing. This was the montage technique, which uh, was pretty old hat, actually, in painting. Well, there is a theory of uh, saying that all things are happening at the same time, and uh, only because we live in a certain way of a uh, certain way of time of looking at time, that we feel that it is all lined up in one line, going coming from one point and going to another point. Well, yes, but this is uh, chronological. Yes, but this is just uh, uh, part of the. Uh, I mean, it's integral in the part of the word medium. We know that uh, things are happening simultaneously, but there's just no way of doing that on a page. You can't do it. If you try, it, would, it just wouldn't work. You could say, well, here is one column, this is going on at the same time, that is going on and that is going on, but it's just not going to, it's just not going to work. You can do it much better, of course, in, uh, in painting. You can do it to uh, come closer in uh, cinema. Film. Yes. In the film, yes. Um, a page, a printed page. Mm. Thank you, thank you. How does it feel you now? Good. Thank, thank you. you. Does, does it seem to be persisting? Good, good. Thank you, thank you. Look at that picture. Look at that picture. Good. Thank you. Good. How does it seem to you now? How does it seem to you now? Thank you. Good. Look at that. Picture. Thank you. Where are we now? Thank you. Good. You seem to be persisting. Thank you. Good. Hello. Good. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Look at that picture. Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. How does it seem to you now? Good. Thank you. Does it seem to be persisting? Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Look at that picture. Look at that picture. Good. Thank you. Good. This text published in Harper's Magazine was an answer to the question, 
when did you stop wanting to be president? <laughs> now this searching question was also put to Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California at the time. And his answer is right next to mine. So I can safely say that the text you are about to hear was read by the President of the United States. He couldn't help it. When did I stop wanting to be president? It's one of those wise guy questions. When did you stop exposing yourself in public? <laughs> president, not me. I don't have the qualification. My political ambitions were simply of a humbler and less conspicuous caliber. I aspired at one time to become commissioner of sewers for St. Louis County. $300 a month with every possibility of getting one shitty paws deep into a slush fund. And to this end, I attended a softball game where such syndicates were assigned to the deserving and the fortunate. Everybody's met said, now I'm old so-and-so running for such and such and anything you do for me, I'll appreciate it. <laughs> My boy screams fanned by this heady atmosphere and three men juleps. I saw myself already in possession of the coveted post, which called for a token appearance twice a week to sign a few letters at the old courthouse. While I'm there, might as well put it on the sheriff some, for some marijuana he has confiscated. And he'd better play ball or will rout a sewer through his front yard. And then across the street to the courthouse cafe for a coffee with some other lazy, worthless bastards in the same line of business, and we wallow in corruption like contented alligators. Remember, Reagan had to read all this. I never wanted to be a front man like Nixon taking the rap, shaking hands and making speeches all day. Who in his right mind would want a job like that? As commissioner of sewers, I would not be called upon to pet babies, have lunch with the queen. In fact, the fewer voters in you mind this is the better. Let kings and presidents keep the limelight. I prefer a whiff of coal gas to the sewers rupture for miles around. I have made a deal on the piping which has bought me a $30,000 home. And there is talk in the press of sex cults and drug orgies carried out in the stink of what made them possible. Fluttering from the roof of my ranch-style house, old glory floats lazily in the tainted breeze. But there were sullen mutters of revolt from the peasantry. My teenage daughters is cunt deep in shit. Is this the American way of life? I thought so, and I didn't want to change. Just sitting there in my garden smoking the sheriff's reefers. I sure did a sweet thing with those pipes, and I'm covered too. What I got on the governor wasn't good on the front page, what is now? And I have my special police to deal with vandalism and sabotage. All oh, handsome youths, languid and vicious as reptiles, described in the press as no more than minions. Lackeys and bodyguards to his majesty, the Sultan of Sewers. Thoughts of youth, long, long thoughts. Then I met the gubernatorial candidate and he looked at me as if trying to focus my image through a telescope. And I felt the dream slipping away from me, receding into the past. Dim, jerky, far away, the discreet gold letters on a glass door. Glass door, William S. Burroughs, Commissioner of Sanitation. <laughs> It was a long time ago, and I have never aspired to political office since. 
The Sultan of Sewers lies buried in a distant 1930s softball game. You know, people are always saying what they would do if they were president. Well, I'll tell you, you would be inexorably pressured by the forces and the individuals who put you in office. Get one inch out of line and they would kill you like they killed Kennedy. Do uh, you have any advice for young writers? Well, uh, no, because advice that may be uh, quite valid for one writer may be quite useless to, to another. Uh, well, you've got to see it. If you can't see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, your reader isn't going to be able to see it. And, uh, well, as uh, Sinclair Lewis says, learn to type. <clears throat> and he also said something which I have found to be very true. He said, if you've just written something that you think is great, you can't wait to show it to somebody or publish it, he said, throw it away, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, I found to be true, quite true. I'll write something that I think is great and I look at it. Uh, a couple of days later, and I say, tear it into very small pieces and put it into somebody else's ash can. It's terrible. I guess I've destroyed, I don't know how many thousands of pages of writing. So, um, and then some, something that I, uh, that I wrote that didn't seem anything special at the time. I've almost, I, some things I, looking through a notebook, uh, I just for, for, have forgotten mm -hmm. uh, that I wrote them. I said, well, this is, this is really something good here. Mm -hmm. Writers are very poor judges of their own work, I find. Mm -hmm. So keep a notebook is one thing. What about dreams? Oh, well, I always write my dreams down, and I get a great deal of material from dreams. So they are a source of material. Oh, good heavens, yes. Well, for me at least. Now, some people, uh, they don't remember their dreams at all. I've talked to people who so say they do not remember ever. They don't remember a single dream. Well, um, Why is that? I always ask them, are they heavy sleepers? And then they usually are. Uh -huh. They forget their dreams in the time it takes them to wake up. We know that everyone dreams, and we know that dreams this is a very important uh, discovery, that dreams are as necessary as sleep itself. Deprived of dream sleep, uh, someone would die mm -hmm. in about a month or two, just as they would die from lack of sleep. No matter how much dreamless sleep they get, mm -hmm. they've, they've experimented with people, they've experimented with animals. They can tell uh, by the ram the rabbit eye movements when people are, or animals are dreaming and this apparently it serves some very uh, essential biological function. It's a biologic necessity. Dreaming is a biologic necessity. Yes, they say even animals dream. Oh, certainly they dream. All warm-blooded creatures dream. Mm -hmm. um, presumably cold-blooded people like uh, cold-blooded people. I mean, cold-blooded uh, creatures, creatures like uh, snakes and fish uh, do not dream. Yeah, they dream. So maybe they have a different mind. Well, they have, obviously, they have a completely different consciousness, almost in, inconceivable uh, to us. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we can identify very well with, um, with animals, mm -hmm. particularly with predatory animals. It's much harder to, uh, to empathize what a deer feels than it is to empathize what a cat feels. Mm -hmm. Much harder. I mean, the idea of something, of something that eats grass is extremely um, alien, I think. Yeah. And I find it very difficult to identify with birds. Mm -hmm. Well, people sometimes ask me if I have any words of advice for young people. And here are a few simple admonitions. <laughs> Never interfere in a boy and girl fight. Beware of whores who say they don't want money. 
In the long run, these are the most expensive whores what can be got. If you are doing business with a religious son of a bitch, get it in writing. Because his word isn't worth shit, not with the good Lord telling him how to fuck you on the deal. If, after having been exposed to someone's presence, you feel as if you lost a quart of plasma, avoid that presence. You need it like you need pernicious anemia. We don't like to hear the word vampire here trying to improve our PR. Interdependence is the key word. Enlightened interdependence. Life in all its rich variety, take a little, leave a little. However, by the inexorable logistics of the vampiric process, they always take more than they leave. Avoid fuck-ups. Fools, I call them. You all know the type. Everything they have anything to do with turns into a disaster, no, how, no matter how good it may sound. Yeah. Trouble for themselves and everyone connected with them. A boo is bad news and it rubs off. Don't let it rub off on you. Do not prefer sympathy to the mentally ill. It's a bottomless pit. Tell them firmly, I'm not paid to listen to this drivel, you are eternal food. And avoid confirmed criminals, they are a special malignant strain of food. Well, here are the Ten Commandments updated. Thou shalt not blow pot smoke into the face of thy pet. Just come oh, on and get high. Oh, look, he's bombed. I will train a raccoon to bite the nose off from such a cretin. Thou shalt not be such a shit you don't know you are one. Is there anyone in this room who has not at some time said to himself, my God, I acted like an absolute shit? If so, let him stand forth so that we can acclaim a later day saint. Don't anybody look at me. I remember in an interview with some reporter and he asked me, Mr. Burroughs, is there anything in your life you regret? Anything you would do differently if you had it to do over? Why is look at him with my mouth open? Oh my God. <laughs> well, I'm lucky if I get through a day without something I regret, something I did wrong. And as for major occurrences, there are mistakes too monstrous for remorse, to tamper or to dally with. Thou shalt not drop an atom bomb or shit one out in the first place. Yes, I'm talking to you, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, known as Opie to his friends. And if you've got an atom bomb for a friend, your only enemy is a judge. When Opie heard the good news about Hiroshima, he said, thank God it wasn't a dud. What God are you thanking for Hiroshima, Oppenheimer? And Truman said, God has given us the other bomb and he will show us how to use it. Oh my God. Hey. I recollect some years ago in Newcastle on Tyne, I was on a panel, well, it was about 10 years ago, with a Dr. Pike, called himself a scientist, and he was defending and extolling the expansion of nuclear installations. Responsible politicians know what they are doing. Nuclear power plants have a splendid safety record, I thought, right then. Sooner or later, boy, oh boy. And I said to him, Dr. Pike is a scientist yourself. You had dealt this acquainted with a fruit fly experiment. Uh, in which generations of fruit flies exposed to radiation have clearly demonstrated that there are no favorable mutations resulting from 
such radiation levels as would be massively released in a major nuclear accident or a nuclear exchange. The roof flies all mutated, to be sure, wouldn't you? And all the mutations observed were unfavorable, grossly unfavorable. Just let me ask you one question, Doctor. Do you want to see your own daughter born with two cunts? I don't know how to answer me. The crucial issue here is not the initial or directly sequential casualties, uh, but long-range cumulative damage to the human genetic pool and responsible biologists bluntly warn it's dirty enough already. One German writer, uh, Gottfried Penn, he uh, phrased uh, uh, a saying that the word is the prick of the mind. That's what he, how he put it. Uh, I'd like to get into the, what is the nature of word? Um, have you, you once talked about a field theory of, uh, of a word. Uh, what were your findings there? I really didn't arrive at any valid conclusions at all except that the word seems to be uh, an organism. And um, also my uh, guess that the, uh, that the written word came before the spoken word. Yeah. Is it an, a dangerous organism or just an organism? Well, uh, I, it depends. It, it, um, it can become dangerous. It acts like a, a, a virus, that is, in, the, in that it replicates itself. Of course, um, you would, a, a virus would not be recognized as a virus, can only be recognized as a virus by its symptoms. And a virus that produced no, um, should we say, um, a psychopath pathological symptoms would not be recognized as a virus. The, the, the symptoms of, a, of, of the virus, where could you detect them when you, in, in words or language? Well, you could, uh, one thing you could detect them in is in that it is compulsive and involuntary. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for anyone to, uh, to stop their flow of words. Most people don't try, but if you try, you find it is extremely difficult. So here's something that's happening against your will, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's something that indicates an influence from the outside. What about the, uh, the language of the mass, mass media or the political language, the demagogic uh, language? Is that influenced by it too, or is that just well, a byproduct? Um, of course, the... Um Political language is always uh, concerned with generalities. Uh, they don't. They don't want to be precise. It's deliberately, uh, deliberately being used to confuse rather than to elucidate. The difference between a, a, a writer is trying to uh, evoke clear images through language, rather an awkward instrument but a uh, politician is trying to do just the opposite. He's trying to cloud issues rather than clear them. Um, now, the writer is mainly, of course, uh, concerned or working with the word, but uh, we have a, a multimedia effect uh, right now going on. Uh, I mean, we as I keep saying we. Uh, we, you can notice it everywhere, like um, music is very important, uh, uh, pictures are very important. Oh, yes, yes, you, you have the um, film medium in which you have, you have words and music and images. Uh, uh, oh, certainly. Could it be helpful for a writer to go out into other medias, like film, well, like you have been, you've been on, on records with yes. uh, Laurie Anderson, and you have been in films. Is that... Uh... Well, since you go into films, then you're in a, yet another medium, and you, you do what you can. You do well or you don't do well. 
uh, simply as a different, uh, uh, different media. He has gone away through invisible morning, leaving a million tape recordings of his voice behind, fading into the cold spring air, posed a colorless question. Question. The, uh, the lines between uh, disciplines are breaking down everywhere. The lines between music and, and um, word, between painting and words and so on, and photography. There's a general tendency for the, uh, the media, the uh, disciplines to be breaking down, the lines to be breaking down. Introducing old man Beckford, uh, cattle, oil, real estate. He owns a big piece of a big state. He's one of the poker playing, whiskey drinking, evil old men who run the United States of America. To these backstage operators, presidents, ambassadors, and cabinet members are just jokes and errand boys. They do what they are told to do or else. His subordinates never know why they have fallen from favor. From favor. That is for them to figure out. Just Stanford knows he is in trouble when the old man steers him into a little side room with one chair. The old man sits down and smiles. You know, Jess, I've got an intuition about you. I think you'd make a mighty fine president. Yes, George. Oh, no, Mr. Bickford, I don't have the qualifications. <laughs> I disagree with you. I think you do have the qualification. You've got a big mouth. <clears throat> now, Jess knows he talked too much at the wrong time to the wrong people. Please, Mr. Bickford, I got a bad heart. The job would kill me. Hey! Bickford smile wide. Uh, William, you did a lot of traveling. You traveled to South America. You lived in uh, Mexico City, Tangier, or, or London for a long time. Do you think that traveling is um, important for a writer? That it adds to his perspective? Well, generally speaking, yes, but there are writers that don't seem to have any necessity to travel at all. Emily Dickinson, um, Beckett, you don't feel has any need to travel. It's all taking place inside. But uh, it's a, certainly as a general proposition, yes, it gives you new perspective, new material, uh, and so forth. It also brings you in contact with uh, other cultures and... Precisely, precisely, yes. And people who have had a completely different conditioning. Can you travel in space? I mean, can you travel in time? Well, um, we don't... Well, we do travel in time, of course, all the time. We move back and forth in time. And um, I have found that... Um, there was a man named Dunn, an experiment, wrote a book called An Experiment with Time, and he found that his dreams consisted not only of the past, but of future events as well. And I have found this to be true since I write my dreams down, and very often I will dream something that then later happens. So in that sense, yes, I think there would be, it's more, uh, it would be easier to travel into the future into, in a real sense than into the past. There is a law of evolution that any uh, change in an organism that involves uh, biologic mutation mm -hmm. is irreversible. Mm -hmm. That is, once uh, a creature gives up its gills and gets air-breathing lungs, they can never get their gills back. The evolution is, in that sense, a one-way street. And that affects, uh, that has something to do with time? Well, yes. Me uh, meaning you can't go back? You can't go back. Mm. You can only go forward. Well, it, it means that you, you, can't, it, you can't go back beyond uh, any change that involves a biologic mutation. Mm. 
I think uh, many of your writings are uh, good teachings in um, how to survive under hostile uh, situations, whatever they may be. Um, does that have anything to do with your, your appeal for weapons? Well, yes, weapons are uh, certainly one, main, one way of surviving in a chaotic situation. Generally speaking, of course, the whole matter of flexibility, being able to um, change and uh, alter your thinking, etc., to accommodate the uh, unfamiliar new situation. So that I would say at the present time, when we have an escalating rate of change, that flexibility is very necessary. Uh, for survival, and therefore that all dogmatic ways of thinking are um, counter, counterproductive so far as survival goes. Yeah. If you can't change and, th and the, the circumstances change, then where are you? Mm. Right. You're bound to, to be extinct. A, yeah, you're at <clears throat> a disadvantage, a terrible disadvantage. Of course, there's a concept saying which, which is very popular at the moment, if there are no, when there are no weapons, then you have peace automatically, so to speak. But I think mm -hmm. that threatens your ability to survive. Well, I do too. I mean, um, what do they mean there? No, there are always weapons. <coughs> right. Even your body, your fists are weapons. Yes, uh, protect or yourself. anything that you can pick up, a, a glass or a chair or any bottle. Solid. I think they're using it for an operating room. Nurse. I can't find your pulse, doctor. Dr. Benway. Cardiac arrest. God damn it. He looks around and picks one of those rubber vacuum cups at the end of a stick they use to unstop toilets. He passes on the patient. Make an incision, Dr. Limp. I'm going to massage the heart. Dr. Lamp shrugs and begins the incision. Dr. Benway washes the suction cup by swishing it around in the toilet bowl. Nurse, shouldn't it be sterilized, Doctor? Very likely, but there's no time. He sits on the suction cup like a cane seat, watching his assistant make the incision. You young squirts couldn't lance a pimple without an electric vibrating scalpel with automatic drain and suture. All the skill is going out of surgery. All the know-how and make do. Did I ever tell you about the time I performed an appendectomy with a rusty sardine can? And once I was caught short without instrument one and removed an interim tumor with my teeth. Well, that was in the upper family and beside the windshield. Dr. Limp, the incision is ready, Doctor. Dr. Benway forces the cup into the incision and works it up and down. Blood spurts all over the doctors, the nurse, and the wall. The cup makes a horrible sucking sound. Nurse, I think she's gone, Doctor. Well, it's on the day's work. He walks across the room to a medicine cabinet. Some fucking drug addict has cut my cocaine with Sani flush. <laughs> Nurse, send the boy out to fill this RX on the double. Thank you. Now, I'd like to take a look at the future. 
if there is any at all. Uh -huh. Well, there's always some. Uh, do you see mankind moving into space? Well, I think it's the only way that he, uh, the only um, possible solution. I don't say that they will, but um, it's the only way I think for them to go. There's no place to go except up and out. To move, yeah. to move into space, uh, is, is there any um, mutation necessary for man, or uh, do you think we're equipped to go? Just I don't to... think we're equipped at all. Uh, that's the point. It would, it would require a biologic mutation quite as drastic as was involved in the uh, shift from water to land. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the possibility, the air-breathing potential must be there before uh, the transition can be made, otherwise it's simply suicidal. And psychologically? Well, uh, any, um, any physiological mutation is going to involve psychological. profound uh, psychological changes, necessarily. And do you see that taking place here already? Uh, or is it very far well, away? Oh, no, I don't think it's very far away at all. We know that if people, um, if the astronauts uh, should stay in space, say, for five years, they'd lose almost all their bones. If you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. And uh, skeletal structure has no, uh, no use in a weightless environment. So the end result would be something rather like a jellyfish, I imagine. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Well, my pleasure. <laughs>